Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are looking at the top five myths to be busted. Do you have an opinion or are you informed? And this podcast will help unpack that and perhaps just uh, raise the bar in terms of what's possible out there for investors. Look forward to seeing you in the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitch Laurentio. Thank you for having me on the show, Mr. Baxter. And we're going to talk about misbelief today. Now, there's a lot of misbelief about your fashion sense. It's actually pretty <laughs> good. Uh, but parking that to the side for a second, let's then apply that philosophy in financial markets. Five most commonly held misbeliefs about financial markets. It's a huge one, isn't it? And people have died in the war. Once you believe something, it's extremely difficult to unravel uh, that belief system uh, and get to the, uh, the the facts of the matter, the truth, I suppose. And uh, and yeah, it's a very emotive subject. People are almost immovable on some things. And you see that sometimes from some of the comments you get on uh, on social media. You put up a post and get absolutely torched by somebody. This is it. And, and, and when you provide a fairly logical and hopefully reasonably intelligent rebuttal, it's just met with anger and frustration. And yeah, the anger phase is, of course, something people go through. But yes, we'll look at five of the biggest uh, and most widely held disbelief. So uh, what have we got, number one? Well, before we do that, AB, I think it's important to note that when we talk about these, and most people will be likely surprised at what we say, it's most likely not their fault. It's what their parents told them, who's their parents told them, and so forth yep. as a generational bias. But nonetheless, there's a few little surprises in here. So Very true. I mean, we, we do get massively influenced by our parents. And, uh, influence. I, I mean, I just had my father on the podcast a few weeks ago, and there are many, many things throughout my life that he's shared as wisdom with me that have been things that have helped me immensely. But also the belief system is, in his case, 80 years old, and the world has moved on quite considerably since then. And yeah, it's, it's hard to convince people that the sun rises in the east. All right. Well, talking about that very core belief, one of those that we always hear about is that number one, cash at the bank is safe. Is that really the case? Mm. I suppose it comes down to what your definition is of safe. Um, If by safe you mean you can't lose your money or lose money on it, that's just simply not true. Uh, And that may come as a bit of a surprise and people are, what what nonsense are you going to come up with? The reality is cash at the bank is not a zero risk investment. People think it is and it genuinely isn't. And here's the reason why. We're in an environment right now where we have significant inflation pressure. What I mean by that is a rise in the cost of living. If you go fill your car up with fuel, if you go to the supermarket to buy food, pay your electricity bill, maybe you pay rent. um, All of those things have been jacking up considerably over the last period of time, which is what contributes towards inflation. Now, if you're holding cash at the bank, and let's be generous and say you're earning half a percent a year on it, and that would be generous. Um, And currently, the official inflation rate in Australia is a a touch under 4%. The reality is it's probably significantly more than that. Fuel for your car has jumped by 50% in the last two months, as an example. Um, If the cost of living is increasing by 4% a year, but the value of your money based on the interest you're earning on it is only growing by half a percent per year. Effectively, at the end of the year, you will be three and a half percent worse off. In other words, your money in terms of what it can buy you in a year's time is less than today because its value has been denigrated or eaten away by inflation. What about tax? Let's assume a 30 percent corporate tax rate on that 0.5 percent. Well, you're paying tax on your interest, which you know, interest is so painfully thin, it's almost an immaterial point. But you're quite right. There's also a tax deduction to take out of that. So you've got to look at what's called a real return. And that is the return on your investment after you've taken out tax and after you've taken out inflation. And effectively, and and this is the kicker, cash is a safe place, cash at the bank is safe. It is not because number one, there is no upside to it. And number two, you are guaranteed that your money would have lost value in the real world this time next year. So you're guaranteeing a loss with no upside. I'm not quite sure how that constitutes being a safe investment. Now, Let's put that into context too. People park cash if they're buying a property, saving up for a deposit, and you have to have some cash working. You know, you have to have some cash to cover your bills and things like that. We get all of that, but we're talking about long-term rumps of cash that are just held there, not being put to work, and effectively your money is is, is being put to sleep. It's anesthetized. And I think it, to explore that a little further, AB, it probably comes down a lot to people's psychology. Hmm. If you've just buried your head in the sand and you're just too scared to deploy that money in anywhere, be it property, bonds, anything, yep. um, it probably tells a lot about the person and their conservative nature, right? Fear is a huge thing, fear of the unknown. And, and going into investing, be that in the stock market or be it in property or managed funds, whatever it may be, um, 
there is a huge fear of the unknown. Everyone knows from such an early age, you know, the, you, you remember when the banks used to come around the schools and you get your money box and you're ingrained, Dolomites, save your money. Yeah. Yeah, save your money, save your money, save your money, cash at the bank, that's the place. So it has been ingrained and changing that record uh, changing that story into suit something that's going to uh, perhaps give you a better financial outcome is a very, very difficult song to sing someone. It's got to be loud, repeated many times uh, to really try and get that point across. And half the time you're dealing with an audience whose arms are folded going, no, nope, cash is safe, never going to lose money holding cash at the bank. Well, unfortunately, it's just factually wrong. Well, there you go. Number one, cash at the bank is safe. Myth busted. Thank you for that, AB. Number two, one that is, I dare say, fairly widely held is that the stock market is more risky than property. Mm. Is that necessarily the case when you break it down? Look, all asset investments can be risky. Uh, it's a question of doing your research, doing your homework and, and picking um, a level of risk in that asset that suits your investment needs. So for example, if we talk about property for a moment, um, you know, good quality blue chip property typically holds its value very well. Yes, it'll move up and yes, it will move down. A lot of people don't believe property moves down. Yes, it does. Uh, we saw that and we've seen that many times before and I suspect we'll see it again as we see interest rates rise this year. Um, but the reality is within the property market, there are uh, areas that are higher risk than others. So for example, um, you know, if you go back to the mining boom uh, pr uh, post GFC, you know, if you had property in Port Hedland, um, you'd have paid you know, not much for it and it ramped up unbelievably, you know, two bedroom fibro house worth 1.4 million renting out at you know, two grand a week. And then all of a sudden when the mining boom slows down, all of a sudden it's worth 350 grand. I actually had a client first hand story who was in business with his brother and they bought a couple of properties in that situation. You know, $1.8 million in negative equity on their two properties there. And over time, it may well come back, but you've still got to service that debt in the meantime, plus your money's tied up somewhere, it's not working. So not all property is the same. Likewise, if you, you compare that and you go, okay, you own something in the eastern suburbs here in Wallara or something like that in Sydney, you know, it's a pretty defensive area. It's always going to hold its value reasonably well. So there are distinctions within the property market in just the same way that they're on the stock market. You know, if you're holding Commonwealth Bank versus, um, you know, Afterpay, for example, they're very different risk profiles. Um, they're both stocks, they're both in the stock market, but they're very different beasts. My argument would be that the stock market doesn't have to be that risky, provided you're educated and you know what you're doing. In just the same way that property doesn't have to be risky, provided you're educated and you know what you're doing. Uh, a case in point with that, and to compare the two is number one, property is a geared investment. So inherently, because it's a geared investment, you're using borrowed money, technically it is a more aggressive, higher risk type of investment because you could be finding yourself in a situation where the asset you have is worth less than the loan that you've got against it. That's a reality that can happen and we will be seeing that happen firsthand over the next 18 months, two years in this economy. Particularly first home buyers are using 5% deposit yep. with a parental guarantee. It's just ludicrous, yep. right? Bank of mum and dad coming to the rescue, but that puts pressure on them and that's a risk that they probably didn't expect to be taking on. Second to that, um, you can actually insure the value of your shares. We do this all the time. Um, so if you're holding a share and you want to protect the value of it, just like you'd insure your car for say 40 grand, if it got written off, you get a check from the insurance company for $40,000, you could buy another car. You can do exactly the same thing with shares. You can't do that in property. So if the market turns down in the stock market and you've got protection in play, your capital is 100% protected from that insurance level. You simply can't do that with, with a property. Now, thirdly is the nature of shares. You can get in and out of them in a heartbeat. So you know, Monday to Friday, 10 till four, the market is open and you can buy and sell your shares at ease with literally a click of a button or a call to us. Now, if the world changes, like we've seen fairly recently, some of the geopolitics, and you might choose to exit certain types of investment, it's as simple as that. Whereas if you're trying to sell a property, even if you're in a fairly robust property market, there is a lead time uh, in order to do that. You've got to have a campaign, you've got to find an agent, you've got to get the building and pass done. All of the different things uh, that can come through uh, within a property purchase. And don't get me wrong, I love property. I've made a fortune out of property. I've also made a fortune out of the stock market. And they're both great asset classes. The challenge is the perception, or should I say misperception, that the stock market is inherently more risky than the property market. And I guess you know, the asset test for that is that most investors, when you own a property, you don't look at the value of that property on a day by day basis, whether it's gone up or down that day. Whereas with the stock market, because the data is live and streaming, you can literally see to the second what your assets worth. And because it's a more visible movement, it tends to be more emotive for a lot of investors, especially new ones. And on the back of that, they tend to see it as being more risky. Simply not the case. Get educated, stack the deck in your favor, manage the risk out of it. 
Awesome. Great analysis, AB. And once again, it comes down to the psychology, as you mm. mentioned. So pushing forward now to number three, uh, a common misbelief is that the wealthy don't use super. <laughs> is that true? Yeah, look, I, uh, I think every weekend, Friday night is troll night on our social media. So someone probably sits down with a couple of beers and gets on there and uh, we run an ad to talk about how the super wealthy uh, use super. And invariably, I can guarantee three, four times a week, some somebody is going to come up with a point, the super wealthy don't use super, they don't need it. Um, got yeah, too much money anyway. They've got too much need money, they, they, you know, they, they, they just don't pay tax, they scam, that all the hate stuff that normally comes through on a Friday when someone's had a few drinks. And, 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 and what that highlights is that for someone that perhaps isn't as cluey as to how self-managed super really works, um, and again, this isn't an area that most people would be aware of, it's a high-level skill to understand exactly how these, uh, these structures work. They think that you know if you're if you're worth a couple hundred million dollars, you know, and you got your 1.6 million in the pension phase, or 1.7 million that now is in the pension phase on your super. Oh, goody, that's my income. Self-managed super has got very very little to do with providing your income while you're retired, and this is something most people don't recognise. Everyone, or sorry, not everyone, but the vast majority of people, when they talk about superannuation, just see it as retirement income. Self-managed superannuation is without question the single most powerful low tax multi and intergenerational asset protection vehicle you could possibly have. So yes, the super wealthy definitely use super. To give you an idea, and there's an article in the Financial Review, uh, last year the ATO did a, a survey to look at the highest valued self-managed super in Australia, it's currently $544 million. Okay, the super wealthy do use super. They don't use it to generate their pension income. They use it to protect their assets and to be able to pass them on to the next generation in a very, very tax effective way. So let's think about this. If you're a, a husband and wife and you own a shopping center and we've got clients that are in that, exactly that space and you've got two kids, you bring them into the family super, you at the point of time where you start to get a little bit old and you look like you're falling off the perch, opt off from being a member of that super, you take a cash payout for your part of it and then you leave the asset base in the, in the, in the superannuation structure so that your kids basically inherit the shopping center becomes their asset when they have kids they do the same thing that is an example of how the super wealthy use self-managed super so don't for a moment be of the misbelief that the super wealthy don't use it that is exactly what they do with it that is exactly how they use it and that's why it's one of the best intergenerational asset protection low tax vehicles you'll find it's got barely anything to do with being able to provide for your pension. Huge misbelief. 15% tax rate, so half the corporate tax rate effectively, yeah. which and, is awesome. And capital gains tax effectively is at 15% instead of you know, 50 for a lot of people. Yeah. So to push I might, forward, I might just add to that, someone will go, well, that's not fair, the rich always get richer. They've just done their research and they've worked out a structure. You know, the actual cash that you need to get into a self-money super isn't as high as people would think, but it's not just about that pension phase. So let's get out of that and realize it's a more holistic uh, vehicle that you can use. Well, to talk uh, in that case, AB, a little bit more about income in particular, mm. the fourth one I've got here for you as a widely held misbelief is that dividend investing is the single best way to do so in the stock market. Is that necessarily the case? Mm. Best is a tricky word, isn't it? It is. You know, what do you define as being claim. the best? Um, this is the best podcast on money and investing. Sure. In my opinion. Okay. Um, and again, we go back to whether it's an opinion or whether it's informed. And, you know, again, let's look at that for a moment. And don't get me wrong, dividends are a very, very useful tool. Here in Australia, because of what's called an imputation credit, um, and effectively how that works is when a lot of companies pay their dividend to their shareholders, they pay the tax on that dividend income at the corporate tax rate. So it's already paid at you know, 30% all intents and purposes. So if you're in a tax structure like superannuation where the tax rate is only 15%, the tax on your income from that dividend has already been overpaid. So you get that credit, it's called an imputation credit, which you can then use to offset other tax. So it's, it is a very, very tax effective vehicle. However, the notion of receiving a dividend, and again, I, I hate to put the pin in the balloon, dividends are the best thing ever. They are very good, but they're not the best thing ever because most people don't realize it's not new money. It's coming out of your left pocket and going in your right pocket. So let me give an example of this. Here's a company called XYZ. It's about to pay a $2 dividend to each of its shareholders. Guess what happens? Your account goes up by $2 because you've received the income and the value of your shares typically drops by $2. So effectively what's happened, $2 of value per share has come out of the assets of the company, making the company worth less, and they've gone into the individual shareholder's pocket. Effectively what that means is the money's gone from your left pocket to your right, it's gone from your capital account to your income account. It's not new 
money. You've just withdrawn it from the asset. Now, to give you an example of this, and again, this will be massively controversial. People will burr up on it, and that's their choice. Their opinion is that it is the best way to go, but they're failing to realize that it's just a redistribution of their capital in the form of income. That's all. If you look at companies that are typically um, low dividend type businesses, growth companies, you see this an awful lot in the US, there's not a lot of dividend play there. They retain the money to grow the business, you make the money on your capital account. When you distribute it to shareholders, it's either for two reasons. One, um, is a reward to the shareholder for their loyalty of holding the business. Or number two, you've got adequate capital to expand the business and grow it in the right way. It doesn't always work that way. You look at Telstra as an example, which is a company that has been a very good yielding stock for investors, um, you know, a nice yield. But the capital value of your shares has been absolutely shredded. Down from nine dollars to nine dollars, nine dollars twenty, so three seventy, um, and yes, you've probably had four or five or six dollars in dividends if you've held those shares over fifteen years, but it's come from your capital account. Now, to put this in a, in a comparable way, let's say you've got your house and you want a thousand dollar a week dividend from it. You could take a thousand dollars a week, draw down on the value of the property, like a mortgage, effectively. So I'm going to refinance. I'm going to take a thousand dollars a week cash out of the business. Now I've got a thousand dollars a week income from my house. You go, this is brilliant. Except when you come to sell that house, whatever the house is worth is going to be less the mortgage or debt that you've incurred on there. Now, there's no debt that's been driven up by paying out a dividend. So there's not a debt inclusion there. But what you have is a substantial reduction in the capital value of the business. Telstra, as we already talked about, great example. There's a stock that was worth nine bucks. It's worth three seventy-five today. Don't forget, also, we've got to take into account inflation. So, nine dollars twenty fifteen years ago. What could that buy you versus three dollars seventy-five in today's money? It simply hasn't kept up with inflation. The capital value of the business has dropped, and the money's been effectively transferred to the shareholders' pocket. The company hasn't retained maybe as much money as it perhaps could and should to focus on future growth in the business. Hence, why there's been a depreciation in the share value. So, yeah, dividends are a great tax-effective. Uh, income source and it's the only income source many stock market investors consider but they're missing the point it's coming out of your capital account it's your own money you're just giving it to yourself by way of income okay we all want income ab so let's talk about as un, as an unashamed plug what we do in the stock market to generate yeah. income look we, we use options to generate income it's new money it's not coming out of the capital account you are creating money by effectively let's use the term renting your share uh, to, to, to another party in the marketplace. It, you earn weekly, monthly income on the back of that. You may well have to sell your shares as part and parcel of that transaction, but you'd be selling them for a profit in the way that we do this anyway. And you're creating net cash flow of you know, somewhere in the order of anywhere between one and two and a half percent a month, as opposed to you know, maybe two and a half to three percent a year. No brainer. And it's new money that's being created. So it's a very different spectrum. But again, the sun does rise in the east, but I can't convince you of that. You've got to work it out for yourself. And yes, dividends are very good, but they're not the best way of generating income. They are a way of generating income. In fact, they're not really creating income. What they're doing is taking money from your capital account and redistributing it to your income account. It's as simple as that. And the example of doing a drawdown against a property is exactly the same thing. When you think about it in those lenses, you go, yeah, actually, you might have a point there. Kind of makes sense. Again, arms will be folded right now. I'd say their hands are going blue by now for some people listening to this. <laughs> How dare he? What would he? know i don't know just been around markets for a very long time and made a lot of money doing it what would you know absolutely um, speaking of which the fifth one i've got to cap us off here ab and is one that a lot of people unfortunately have put their trust in yet haven't had that receded on the on, on you know back to them is give your money to the pros they know what they know what they're doing we're talking fund managers here in particular is that necessarily the case <laughs> Um, let's look at some of the research rather than an opinion and then it becomes informed, which is, I guess, the whole tenor of, of what this podcast is today. Looking at CanStar, which, you know, CanStar are Australia's leading independent financial research website. Very reputable. And they go through and they C-A-N-S-T-A-R, go and look it up yourself. Um, yeah, they, they, they'll research what's the best performing super, what's the best managed fund, what's the best insurance, what's the best car insurance, all that sort of stuff that can really help direct people in the right areas uh, to get them where they need to be. And there's a report on CanStar, it's a couple of months old now, and I think it made it into the Morning Herald today. Um, over 80% of fund managers in an actively managed fund over a five-year window, we're not looking this week, this month, a five-year window, underperform the index. 
and that's in the last two years of what has been a very, very strong bull market yeah. too. So the notion of we'll give them, a, 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 I'm not going to get educated and learn how to manage my money so I can understand how to generate new cash flow, manage risk by using things like stop losses or buying insurance. So none of that is of interest to me. I just want to give my money to somebody else to look after it. And I guess the moral dilemma in doing that, nobody is ever going to look after your money in the same way that you would yourself, provided, of course, you've had a level of education, you know what you're doing with it. Secondly, um, yeah, the funds management industry is all about funds under management. Why? Because more under management, more money you get paid. Win, lose, or draw, you still get paid your funds under management. So, you know, it's a it's a it's an interesting business model that's not necessarily as performance driven. And fund managers have demonstrably been unable to create what's called alpha, which is value add for investors, where you've outperformed the market to the tune of eighty percent of them. So you might be very fortunate where you've picked the one in five. The two in 10 that are able to outperform the market, but the vast majority of people will be in funds that have underperformed the market. Simple as that. That's according to CanStar, they don't my numbers. So you got to ask yourself, you know, is it possible for you to do this? You know, can you, can you do better than that? And how, come, how can you do better than someone that this is all they do for a living? The answer is really simple. You could be in an index tracking fund to start with, which is going to perform in line with the index, which is better than 80% of them before you start, lower fees. Uh, we do a lot of work in the exchange traded fund space to help our clients be able to do exactly that. But then add alpha by having sectoral views and, and being in oil, for example, right now, which has been very lucrative, or wheat, which has been very, very lucrative, or in energy, which has been very lucrative, uh, by having that sort of value add, but the vast majority of their portfolio will be in, in, in the tracking uh, of the market. So they're going to get performance in line with, if not slightly better. And that's what this is all about. But it, it takes a level of skill to do that. So we go back to the, the sort of premise, everybody, Mitch, has an opinion. But just because you have an opinion, and everyone's entitled to their own opinion, it's their life, their story, their money, but is it really informed? And the answer in the case of most people, as you've already alluded to, is probably no, and it's not their fault. Where do you go to get this information? This is all we do. We live and breathe this space of teaching people how to become better quality investors by being able to create tomorrow's wealth today. Simple as that. And and learning how to do this is not as hard as people would think. Yes, you've got to do some work. This is not get rich quick. It's not some magic plug it in the wall and it spits out money. It's, you've got to do some work, which is a scary thing for a lot of people. And it's that step into the unknown. Can it work for me? That disbelief, because maybe they've been conditioned over years that they've made some bad investment choices, so everything they touch doesn't work. So this is never going to work for me, nothing else has. This is about creating a new ending to that story by upskilling and learning how these things work for real, by learning it off professionals like ourselves. This is all we do. We do it all day, every day. I've done it now for 30 years. Your tenure is a little bit shorter, but it's just as intense in learning exactly how these things work. Cash at the bank is dead money. Yes, you need some there to better cover your bills. But if that's your mainstay asset, you're all leave the stock market or property loan, it's overdone. The stock market has got tremendous opportunity in it and you can protect it by buying insurance. You know, do that. Take an active step. Learn how to do it. Create new money, not just dividends and create that return on a consistent basis. It's not as hard as people would think, but their opinion is that, oh, that'd be really hard. Their opinion would be, I couldn't do that. Their opinion is you can't trust anybody. That's right. Any person you can trust is yourself. Best investment you'll ever make is also in yourself. Invest, in yourself, learn how to manage it, trust yourself to take that action step and you'll be blown away where it can take you. And if you do have the courage to step on and start that journey, we'd certainly love to help. But if you've got the courage to step on and start that journey, the five points that we've talked to today, the myths being busted, the opinions versus being informed, in a year's time, you'll look back at that and go, do you know something that's absolutely right? But convincing people of that right now, when they're so died in the wall and for the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years of their life, they've been told a particular story that they've come to believe, even though it's wrong, pretty hard to do. Invest in yourself, get the facts, stop being opinionated and instead become informed and you'll be blown away what that will do to your finances. Great way to finish, AB. Absolutely awesome episode on that one. Five commonly held misbeliefs, all debunked, and a great call to action there. So thanks very much for your time once again. Absolute pleasure. Anytime, Mitch. There you have it, guys. Make sure you give us a review and a rating so we can get this message out further, and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.